Go ahead and have a seat if you would. When uh, the first time I ever went to Wrigley Field, uh, which is the, the baseball field in Chicago where the Cubs play, it's really a kind of a quaint ballpark. It's an old school ballpark. And I was, just, I was 22 years old, I'm with the Pirates, and it was just really this cool experience. But what I remember about it wasn't the field, it wasn't how quaint it was. By the way, the, in the other days, they've redone the park since then. The dugouts are really short, so if something happened, and like during the game, somebody on your team did something good and you stood up real quick, you would literally smoke your head on this concrete dugout top. They've changed them since then, but it's crazy. It was old school. But what I remember about that, that first time in there was I'm just a kid and the Pirates are a veteran bunch of, bunch of guys and they're fighting for their division and won the division that year. But, but they, they, they played a practical joke on a kid. And it's been done since then in Wrigley. It's kind of where it always happens. But one of our guys, and I think it was our trainer, a guy named Tony Bartirom, I'm not sure. But, but he told the bat boy, the bat boys are usually in their late teens, 18, 19, maybe 20 years old. Hey, I want you to go out to the umpire. The umpire should just come on the field. And, and I want you to tell them we're missing the key to the batter's box. We need the key to the batter's box. And so the bad boy doesn't know any better. And so he goes out, and there's the umpire, and he says, hey, uh, uh, they told me to come out. We need the key to the batter's box. Well, he knows it's a joke. It's an old joke in baseball, and you're messing with this guy. And so he sends him over the Cubs dugout looking for the key to the batter's box. And the, the Cubs know that something's up, so they know it's a joke, so they send him somewhere else. And they had this kid, like, running all over the place. I mean, the game started, and the kid's still out looking for the key to the batter's box. Now, if you don't understand why that's both a little bit humorous and futile. I want to show you a picture. Here's a picture. You, you see that little, that box, that box-shaped chalk thing there? That's the batter's box. <laughs> there is no key to that box. At least if there was, I never found it. Let me just leave it that way. But the, you just step into it. And this kid was running all over the place looking for the key to the batter's box. Here's the deal. And there's a point to it. it contentment is like that. If you go looking for contentment and try to find contentment in your life, you're no more apt to find contentment than that young man was apt to find the key to the batter's box. Now, let me ask you a question, a diagnostic question today as we start before we look in God's Word. Uh, if you were going to rate your contentment in your life today on a scale of 1 to 10, how content are you, 1 or 0 being the least, I guess? 10 being the most, where, where would you put yourself on that scale of contentment in your life? Think about that for a second. Where are you? Put, mentally put yourself on that scale where you think you would, where you feel like you are. Now, with that in mind, I want to read you the passage. We're, going to, we're still in Philippians chapter 4. We'll be there one more week after this week. But today we're talking about contentment. And at the end, we're going to get to a verse that many of you know, and you're going to see the verse maybe is not saying exactly what you thought it was. Here's God's word. Listen, Philippians 4, beginning in verse 10, which is where he picked up off last week. Paul says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now, let me stop there for a moment. He says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Do you notice right away, Paul is practicing what he was preaching just a few verses ago. Remember, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And he says, yeah, I, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Well, why? Why was he rejoicing in the Lord? Listen that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Now, remember, Paul is writing. He is in a Roman prison, and he's writing to the Philippians. This is a church that he began a number of years before, and he's writing to thank them for a gift they had sent him while he's in prison. So he's there with, I'm sure, great needs, and he's thanking them for their gift. And so he says... Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me." So the letter is kind of beginning to draw to a close, this letter that he's writing them from prison. And, and he's expressing this gratitude to them. And, and it wasn't that he was dissatisfied as he's expressing his gratitude because he's content. Even in the situation he's in, in prison, even though he doesn't have much, he is content. Now, this is the interesting thing. Now, now catch what I'm about to say or you'll kind of miss what Paul does here in this, in this passage. 
he takes one of the great Greek and Roman words for ethics, and I'm going to put it on the screen for you. Here's the word, and I, I listened to it on, on my Greek software, and I, I can't say it even after listening to it. I'll say it kind of phonetically, autarkies, but the word means this, and this is how, this is how it was used in that Roman culture. It means entirely self-sufficient. So the word means entirely self-sufficient. This self-sufficiency was the highest aim of the Stoic philosophers of that day. That's what they wanted. They wanted to be entirely independent of everyone else, totally self-sufficient. Now, how did they get there? How did they think they could be totally self-sufficient? First of all, they proposed to eliminate all desire. They didn't want any desire for anything. Now, they got this right, this part they got right. They understood that contentment didn't come from having more things. Their desire was contentment came from not desiring anything. They wanted all desire gone, abolish any desire for any possession for anything. And not only that, they also proposed to eliminate all emotion. You don't, don't care about anything or anyone. Don't care about yourself. Don't care about anyone else. Be entirely self-sufficient. And to be self-sufficient, you just remove all desires, all care. You just root love out of life. There could be no love because then you would care. And said so they, wanted, they wanted this emotional existence where they didn't care about anyone and they were entirely self-sufficient. One of the scholars of that era said this. He said, his name is T.R. Glover. He said, the Stoics made of their heart a desert and called it a peace. You see the idea, remove any desire, any love, any emotion, and now I don't have any tie to anyone else, so I have a peace. That's how they viewed it. But Paul takes the same word, this word that the Philippians would have understood, and he takes it and gives it a distinctly Christian meaning. He takes it and he just twists it and he changes the meaning of it. And instead of contentment coming from the I don't care attitude, it comes from finding dependence in other people, but especially in finding dependency in Christ. He takes it and twists it and makes that the new definition of it. So with that in mind, I want us to look at four points that tell us how you and I can have contentment in life, all right? So here's the first one. Contentment is not found, it's learned. That was the point of that story about the kid looking for the key to the batter's box. Contentment is not found, it's learned. Now, where do we look for contentment? I was just thinking about this um, this week when I was preparing this, and it, it, we kind of look in the same places. There's a time in every person's life, maybe you're that age now, where you're thinking, and maybe, maybe you're beyond that age and you're married, but there was a time when in my life I thought, you know what, man, when I get married, I'm going to be content. I'm going to be content. Then I got married. I was content. Josie wasn't. <laughs> see, Josie thought the same thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get married, and I'm going to be content. But the reality is, see, I'm, I'm expecting, I was expecting, and if that's you today, you're not married, and you think, I'm going to get married, then I'm going to be content, you're looking for something to make you content. And you're going to find out marriage. By the way, marriage is great. I'm the biggest proponent of love marriage, and so grateful for my marriage with Josie for all these years. But marriage is not going to make you content. And when you're married, you think, well, when I have kids, when I have kids, I'm going to be content. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> I've, I've got my, my late friend, Tom Schrader. Tom was, Tom was one of the funniest guys I ever met. And, and he tells a story. It's a sad story, a true story. He had two daughters. And when one of his daughters was about, I think she was 11 or 12 years old. She was a little cheerleader for this basketball league. And, and they would go to the league and his daughter would cheer. Well, he got there early. And he, he, Tom just has a wicked sense of humor, and he's very direct and held nothing back. He's a great Bible teacher. But he says he gets there early, and they're watching the game before the game where his daughter is going to cheer. And these little guys are playing. And there's one little guy on one of the teams that's a pretty good little basketball player. And he said, but when the game is over, that little kid comes off the court. But there's another kid on his team that comes off the court, and that kid's dad steps down to him. And he says he's listening to the conversation as they're walking out of the gym. And this dad's talking about the little boy that's so good to his son. And he said, man, son, that Billy sure can't play, can he? Man, he can sure handle that ball. And can he shoot? Man, and pass and run that team? Was he something? And man, he is quick too, isn't he? And he was going on and on and on about little Billy. This is a dad that was probably looking for contentment in his own son, and it wasn't measuring up the way he thought it should. 
And he said, he just went on and on about this kid. And Tom said, you know what? He said, I wish that little kid would have said to his dad, I wish he'd have said, yeah, dad, that little Billy, he sure is good, isn't he, dad? And he sure can dribble, can he, dad? He can handle that ball, and he sure can shoot, and he sure is quick, can he, dad? You know why, dad? You know why, dad? You know why, dad? Because he got his dad's genes, dad, that's why. <laughs> no, he shouldn't have said that. But you get the point. See, we, we think this person or this thing is going to make us content. Or, or maybe it's not a person. We're looking at some title. We're looking at some position. We're looking at some place. We're expecting something to make us content. But the point is contentment can't be found. That's, that's the point here. Contentment is learned. Listen to what Paul says. He says in verse 11, I have learned to be content. In, in verse 12, he says, this is paraphrased, I've learned the secret of being content. Why would Paul have to learn to be content? A guy like Paul that did so many things and was so amazing, he had to learn to be content. Here, here's why I think Paul and all of us have to learn to be content. It's because God is ultimately glorified when you and I have to struggle with the things of this world that we think will make us content. We, when we have to struggle to have those things weaned from our lives, it ultimately brings glory to God when we let go of the things of this world and trust him instead. That's the idea. Uh, I read an illustration this week that I think really shows this, and moms can understand this better than dads, but you'll get the picture. You think about a baby. A ba we'll say a little boy is born, and, and his mom is nourishing him and feeding him. And for the first few months of his life, all he knows is his mom. Every meal is from his mom. He's, he cries. The mom knows what to do. She feeds her little boy. And then he's content, right? But a day comes when that little boy wants to come to mom for nourishment, and she pushes him away, and she begins to wean him, and he screams, and he yells, and he cries. But the mom knows that unless she does this, He's never going to learn. He's never going to learn to drink from a bottle. He's never going to learn to eat. He's never going to have a meal with his brothers and his sisters unless he learns that this is not something he has his whole life. It, it, here's the idea. When the job is done and the child is weaned, he no longer begs for what he once thought was absolutely indispensable to his life. And that's what God does in our lives. There are things that we think are absolutely indispensable and necessary for us to be content. And God is glorified when those things are weaned out of our lives. And we learn to depend on him and not those things. See, most of us live with just the opposite principle. Instead of thinking, instead of thinking there are things that should be weaned from our lives for us to be content, we think, well, I need more of this. I need this thing over here. I need this over here are some of those things we talked about. But the reality is we don't those things won't bring us contentment. See, our, our problem is instead of being weaned from the world, we're kind of glued to the world. And when we're glued to this world, we're never going to have real contentment. That's the first point. Here's the second point. Contentment is learned in the struggles of life. That's typically where we learn them. Verse 12, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. And just in case we don't get it, he says, in any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Now, it's easy to assume here uh, that Paul is saying, well, being well-fed is a good thing and being hungry is a bad thing. But if you think that, you're, you're missing the point. And in fact, if you're thinking that, remember there are places in Scripture where Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to get into heaven. So kind of let that soak in a little bit. The, the reality here is, is, is that... And the difficulties of life are where we tend to start to learn we need to let go of some things. I want to illustrate this of how we chase the wrong things in a movie. Some of you, have, probably a lot of you have seen this movie. It's an old one now, but it, it, it's, it's, called, it's, it's about the first Jamaican bobsled team to go to the Olympics. Remember the movie? It's called Cool Runnings. I'm not recommending the movie, by the way. Don't go out and watch it, okay? Don't do that. I'm not just, but there's a line in the movie I want you to hear in a minute. In the movie, um, the first Jamaican bobsled team, John Candy plays the former American bobsledder. And, and he's like, he endears himself to them. They begin to really like him. And then they learn a dark secret about him. He was a two-time gold medal winner in the movie, uh, in, in the bobsled. And then they found out this dark secret that the following Olympics he had cheated 
and brought disgrace to himself and his team. And here's a conversation between one of the members of that Jamaican team and John Candy. Watch. Hey, coach. Yeah. I have to ask you a question. Sure. But you don't have to answer if you don't want to. I mean, I want you to, but if you can't, I understand. You want to know why I cheated, right? Yes, I do. That's a fair question. It's quite simple, really. I had to win. You see, Dries, I'd made winning my whole life. And when you make winning your whole life, you have to keep on winning, no matter what. You understand that? No, I don't understand, Coach. You had two gold medals. You had it all. Therese, a gold medal is a wonderful thing. But if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. <laughs> Here's the point. Most of us have something that we think, I gotta have this thing to be content. Probably not a gold medal, but there's something. Maybe it's written, maybe you've got it on paper, maybe it's just in your mind, maybe it's some image, maybe it's some goal, maybe it's some title, maybe it's some relationship. It, I don't know what it is for you. But the same principle is true. If you're not content without it, you're not going to be content with it. That's what these, these verses are saying to us. That's the picture here. Here's the next point, contentment. This is important, listen. Contentment begins with confidence in God's providence. You want to begin to be content? It begins with having confidence in God's providence. Listen to what Warren Wiersbe says here. In this day of scientific achievement, we hear less and less about the providence of God. We sometimes get the idea that the world is a vast natural machine and that even God himself cannot interrupt the wheels as they're turning. But the Word of God clearly teaches the providential workings of God in nature and in the lives of His people. The word providence comes from two Latin words, pro meaning before and video meaning to see. God's providence simply means that God sees it to it beforehand. It does not mean that God simply knows beforehand because providence involves much more. It is the working of God in advance to arrange circumstances and situations. Listen for the fulfilling of his purposes. In verse 12, Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content. Don't you, don't you love secrets? I mean, everybody loves to hear a good secret. Yesterday, we had all six of our grandkids in our house. I'm grateful only two are there today. So we had all six of them there, and all six of them went running through the house at one time, and, and including the two two-year-olds, and just all six, from eight to two, just, just stampede through the house. And one of the moms, either my daughter or our daughter-in-law, one and said, where are you guys going? And Molly Six said, we're heading to a secret meeting. And she had this glimmer in her eye. See, everybody likes a secret. Paul says, here, here's the secret of being content. What is it? I think, I think you hear it in two phrases here. Listen in verse 11. Whatever the circumstances. And then in verse 12, in any and every situation. You see, that pretty much covers all of life, doesn't it? Those two phrases there. And the secret, I think, here is this, is that no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situations, God is at work in them. God is at work fulfilling his plan and his purpose and also his plan and purpose for your life. We talk about it in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him who are called according to his purpose. God is at work in our lives. Proverbs 16 tells us, 16.33, that nothing happens by chance. Contentment is possible when you and I begin to understand that God is at work. God is at work in creation. He's at work in your life. He's at work in my life, fulfilling his purposes and also his purposes for your life. And so do you understand that when we begin to understand that whatever the circumstances are, 
good or bad in our eyes, difficult or great, whatever they are, that when God is at work, we can be content that God is working in our lives to fulfill his purposes. I, I, confession, I don't always see and understand what God is doing in my life when he's at work. I, don't, I generally don't see it as it's happening, and sometimes I can't figure it out after the fact. But I know I can trust him. That's, that's the old adage. You know, that's when you have the old spiritual truth. You can trust him because... He's God and I'm not. He's God and you're not. And that's just the reality. Let me read you, read you one more quote. This one from John MacArthur about this same principle. He says, and there is this baseline element in contentment, that great confidence that God has not forgotten me. Isn't that great? That great confidence that God has not forgotten me, that God is attentive to me, that God knows the number of hairs on my head, that God understands everything about my life, maybe even puts my tears in a bottle. God knows my uprising and my downsitting. He knows my coming and my going. I'm the constant focus of his omniscient love. Do you hear that? I am the constant focus of his omniscient love. And he orders everything in his universe to bring to pass my good. When you believe that, you will experience contentment. That's a really good quote. Fourth point, contentment doesn't come naturally but supernaturally. Now, here, here's that verse I read at the beginning. It's such a well-known verse, but maybe you never realize it came after this discussion of contentment. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's a wonderful verse, but I think a lot of us read, read our own interpretation into it and maybe add things to it that Paul really wasn't intending when he said it. You know, people say, you can do whatever you want to do. You can accomplish anything you want to accomplish. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Well, let me help. Let me ask you a question. If I told you today, well, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I'm not a pilot, but I'm going to go fly today. You want to come fly with me? No, because that's not what the verse is talking about, right? It, that's not the intention. That's not what it's saying. I, I have a lot of friends, athletes, that would sign their name, their autograph. They'd sign their name and write Philippians 4.30, which, by the way, is a fine thing. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a great verse. It's still a verse. has not changed. It has not, not lost any impact at all. It's just a little different than some others have used it in the past. Some would write it inside the bill of their hat and look at it, Philippians 4.13, like it was a magic code. It's not. That's not the point. Here's the point. The, the phrase here, all things, must be defined in the context of what Paul is writing about. Context rules. Context is king in Scripture interpretation is one of the things it said. And Paul is talking about contentment in any and every circumstance. And in verse 13, he explains how he's been able to live above and beyond any circumstance. And he has faced some difficult, difficult, difficult circumstances in his life. And he says, I did it by the indwelling power of Jesus Christ in my life. He was content precisely because he had learned to depend on the Lord Jesus Christ and his power. I'll read you one more quote. Ray Pritchard says this, are we who believe better than other people? No. Do we suffer? Yes. What makes the difference? We have the power of the indwelling Christ who gives us the strength we need. Is it enough? Is Jesus Christ enough for the problems of life? Is his broken body enough? Is his shed blood sufficient? Is his intercession in heaven able to sustain us? Can his power meet the problems of life? Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. And the saints across the ages testify that Jesus Christ is enough. Paul says the secret of contentment is relationship in Christ. See, the, the Stoics were saying, and it's all about self-sufficiency, Paul writes, and he takes that word and he twists it and he says, no, it's not about self-sufficiency. It's about Christ's sufficiency. The Stoics say finding, finding contentment, you find it in your own power. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You find it in relying on the power of Christ in your life. He will empower you in these situations. Here, here's what that verse literally says, Philippians 4.13. As to all things, I am inwardly strong in the one empowering me. And Paul had such a wide variety of difficult situations. You go read about his life and you know his life and shipwrecks and being beat almost literally almost to death and stoned and snake bed and you name shipwrecked, you name it, all these things. And he says, I've learned that in all these things, Christ is 
enough. The Phillips translation translates the verse this way. I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. Is that great? I'm ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. The Living Bible says it this way. I rarely quote the Living Bible, but I love how it says this. For I can do everything God asks me to with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and power. Isn't that great? This week, um, well, I, I studied today earlier because I knew all the grandkids were coming over. And so Wednesday morning, I started really early studying. I'm, at my, I'm at home in my study and I'm studying. And I'd gone to early afternoon and I, I was getting tired. And, and I, take, I take little short naps. I mean, I say short naps, really short naps. You came back yesterday. <laughs> I was so tired with all the grandkids and stuff. And I was getting ready to come to church last night. And, and Josie knew I just had a minute. I said, Josie, I've got six minutes for a nap. Wake me up in six minutes. That's literally what I had. And she said, you can't sleep. I said, just try me. Six minutes later, she woke me up. So I take little short naps. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm studying at home and I'm getting tired. This is Wednesday and I need a break. And so I just go sit in my chair in my study and I'm just gonna take a little five or 10 minute nap and it kind of revives me. If I go longer, I'm toast, but just a short one. So I take this little short nap and I woke up. And when I woke up, I've been meditating and reading the scripture and studying it all day. And like a poem was like, brewing in my head. Well, I don't write poetry. I mean, do I look like a guy that writes poetry? Anyway, so, but it's, it, it's not there, but it's almost there. So I go sit down and I write a poem about this sermon. And so this is really cheesy, but I'm going to read you my poem I wrote, okay? But it says what I'm trying to say in the sermon, and, and I'll try to make it not too, too cheesy. But, but I, I, if I had to give it a title, I would call it Drop the Eye. I've searched all over Facebook and on the internet. I've looked high and low and everywhere, but I haven't found it yet. I chased it when I was a boy. I chased it while in school. I chased it on the playing field at a time when that seemed cool. I want contentment. Yes, I do. I'll go to any length except the one that must be done. Drop the eye and trust his strength. You want to have contentment. No, 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 it's just cheesy, but it's true. Listen, you want to have contentment. You drop the eye and you trust his strength. That's what Paul's saying. Contentment is not found. It's learned. It's learned often in the struggles of life. It's learned when we realize that God is in control and he is building his stuff into your life. He is at work in your life. If you know Christ today, building you into the person that he wants you to be and bringing him glory, fulfilling his purposes. And it happens when he empowers us, when we depend on him instead of on ourselves. That's the point. Let me read you the verse, verse 13 from one more translation. It's, this is from the Amplified Bible, and I think it absolutely nails the verse. Listen. I can do all things which he has called me to do through him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill his purpose. Listen, I love this next expression. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength and confident peace. Question for us today and for you today, for me today. Are we ready to drop the eye and trust his strength? God is at work in your life, causing just that very thing to happen.